yeah, we can have the best program in the world. We can have, oh yeah, we got all these strength diagnostics. We're doing this special test. We're doing all this jazz. But the coach, the coach ain't interested. The coach don't want you doing it. No. Because they don't know about it. They don't know about it. And then you've and got... And hand on heart, honestly can say, I'm probably guilty of it as well. I've turned around and said, what is this nonsense? Welcome back to the Punchline Podcast. Mo, the head coach. It's all about Mike, body and soul. Make sure you subscribe, like, comment and share this video. So I'm going to introduce Reese from Black Country Therapy and Conditioning. Yeah, so my name's Reese. I've been in the SNC environment for about 18 months to two years now. I'm working with a range of sports, um, combat disciplines, pre predominantly boxing, and just sort of growing our practices that way. Um, I was previously an M Resbursary student at the University of Wolverhampton, where I overran the um, SNC practices for WLV Sport. So working a variety of team sports and working with the, um, you know, dice um, judo, you know, dice boxing program. They do a dice judo program as well. And I oversaw the SNC practices for that as well. So yeah, been about for about two years and, you know, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. And uh, so yeah, well, happy days, enjoy myself. So obviously a lot of people talk about strength and conditioning. Give us the official what, what is the official subject? What, what does it consist of? Because a lot of coaches will say it, but they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, a, a lot of podcasts will say that rather than a lot of S&C coaches, they've got a sort of Mickey Mouse qualification and, you know, all the David Lloyd um, specialism, as which Joe Gallagher talks about a lot. But in terms of the overview of what strength and conditioning is, it predominantly is developing physical qualities of athletes of all levels, not just athletes, but clients in general. So I do have clients that are outside of the athlete realm as well. But over, over, overall is that you've got to prevent injuries, right? And if you increase strength and you make the body more robust, physically robust, um, you're going to keep the athlete in, in the gym. So the only boxer that's not going to develop is one that isn't in the gym, right? So if they're injured, they're not going to be in the gym. So if we can prevent that as much as possible, um, they'll be in the gym and the development will, will hopefully. The therapy side, what, what does that consist of? So that's something that we're developing at the moment. So yeah, because it is quite confusing, right? You thought uh, I've seen stuff, conditioning, yeah, sure. I've seen stuff like people going into like a massive fridge and just the heads popping out and stuff like that. So what is it called? Cryotherapy? Yeah, yeah. so there is, a, there is that. I mean, like our therapy element at the moment mainly consists of sort of recovery modalities that, because so I'm in partnership with my girlfriend, uh, Lucy. So she does a lot of that stuff. So she's looking after sort of the sports massage side, the mobility elements and covering um recovery modalities and you know you, you talk about cryo chambers you, you were actually looking to invest in a set of it's like cryo cuffs that you put your legs in have you saw those um that people can use and again just to you know enha enhance that recovery mechanism so that's a therapy element that we're looking to sort of add in the next sort of i'd say in the next month or so we really look to zone that in and, and, and progress that element of it um so yeah that's a little old overview of that so what made you get into it what what's the interest how did well, it come about well that's a, i did my undergrad degree at Coventry University. So um, I graduated as a sports therapist in 2017. And that's where it sort of stemmed about right then. When I was boxing myself, you know, I had a gammy elbow all the time, shoulder was killing me, and I just lacked really bad flexibility and mobility. And I was like, you know what, this, this, and it seems a reoccurring theme as well. You speak to boxers, you speak to combat athletes, like they're stiff all the time, right? Because you think you're in that on guard position, you're constantly flexed over and, 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 I'm thinking, right, how can we, how can we improve that? And how can we uh, make the body more flexible and more mobile and as well, and just help prevent injuries as well. That's, that, that's our main overview of what we're looking to do. So what causes all these injuries? So you talked about people getting injured and taking time off. What actually causes the injury? Is it overtraining? Is it lack of technique? What is it? Well, it's a multitude of factors when you're talking about injury. I mean, I, I do think that there is a big contributing factor to technical elements and definitely overtraining with your combat sports. I mean, especially boxing, you see guys in the gym, they think doing more is better, right? And, and or they think doing more miles on the road is better, which is not, we've got to think about not training harder. Let's think about, right, then how can we train a bit smarter with our practices? How can we make the most of every single session that we're participating in, whether that's a boxing session, whether that's a recovery session, whether that's an SNC session, how can we maximize the gains that we're looking to get? So what are the typical exercises you put people through or routines? How often would they see you? How, would, how often do they have a consultation? 
What do you put them through? What measurements do you take? At the moment, we're work in terms of measurements. We're actually we've got a partnership going with the University of Wolverhampton, so we have access to their labs and to their testing facility. So we've got different strength diagnostics, uh, VL2 max testing, and that's something that we're looking to get first and foremost is get our F athletes on. Any athlete that comes with us, we want a testing battery, whether that's strength diagnostics, VO2, um, rep max tests, whatever that is, we need to get some data because if you're not testing, you're, you're, you're just guessing, aren't you? Pretty much. Um, and then from there, in terms of strength, it depends on where the athletes are. I mean, like, especially with boxing, SNC is new. SNC is new, man. It's like it's a new guy on the block. You know what I mean? And the first thing we've got to do is educate boxing coaches about where we fit in. So first and foremost, you think about it. If you've got, because usually the boxing coach oversees everything, right? He looks after everything. And we know everything as well. Yeah, exactly. And I know everything. Yeah, I, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of speaking to coaches about it, don't try and come in and be like, oh, this is what I do. Don't try and be understood from the off. Try and understand the environment that you're going into. And understand boxing. Understand what the boxing coach is thinking. If he's saying to you, listen, Reese, I'm the new guy on the block and I don't really know what you do. I don't really trust you. I'm usually overseeing everything for the last four to five years. So what are, what are you doing? And you've got to slowly develop that relationship with the coach predominantly because the coach is the one who you've got to buy into because you don't want to be the athlete buying into it, but the coach is like, mm, no, I'm not buying into this. So if, the first thing I try and do is get in contact with the coach, speak to the coach and tell them, sometimes I say to them, come to a session. Come to a session, man. Just come see what we do. Because um, that's the only way that you develop that rapport and they got an understanding about what you're doing. I mean, it's not unusual for me to send a 12-week block to a boxing coach. That's, that's, that's completely normal for me. It doesn't, obviously, you want the coach to understand and sometimes they won't. If they're looking at a 12-week block, like, oh, geez, what's this? But you're trying to get them involved in the process and it's not a separate entity. The SNC is not a some buy-in. Exactly. It, it, buy-in's huge because... Yeah, we can have the best program in the world. We can have, oh yeah, we've got all these strength diagnostics. We're doing this special test. We're doing all this jazz. But the coach, the coach ain't interested. The coach don't want you doing it. So, Because they don't know about it. They don't know about it. And then you've and got- And I hand on heart honestly can say, I'm probably guilty of it as well. I've turned around and said, what is this nonsense? But now I've come to understand it a little bit more over the last probably three or four years. Mm. I do understand the, the importance of it. And it's just the way it's branded, I think, is what confuses us. It's basically something that's good for your athletes. That's how I think you should sell it. It's like a care package. Let, let, let's not make, let's not complicate the process. Don't don't try and and technical jargon. Ah, oh, man. Talking about technical jargon, you said VO two max test. Mm. I know what that is, but for the viewers out there who don't know what that is, let's have a description of what you actually do and what you're looking for. Yeah, so it's basically the amount, the maximal amount of oxygen that your body can uptake and can handle. At that at, at a given intensity, simple as that. Let's not complicate things. No need, no, no, no need to know any more than that. And the higher that number is, the more. So I was going to say aerobically, but let's give it a technical jargon. The more cardiovascularly you're developed. Was that and and the so better, you're healthier. Yep, and the better you can handle intensities. All right. So now we've got that base measurement. Yeah. Let's say I've got a, a base measurement for myself. How would you improve that? Yeah, so you've got, say you've got a VO2 max measure of, let's say, X amount. You've got particular conditioning protocols that we would implement. So whether that's high intensity intervals, um, whether that's your longer duration intervals, so your high intensity intervals, we're thinking, you know, your 30, 15, so your 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off on a treadmill. Or if you're at, say, the starter camp, we might think, right, then can we do four times four minutes? So four minutes on, two minutes off and repeat that four times, just to bump and get you used to those intensities. and the thing is, especially about hit training as well, it is very demanding. It's exceptionally demanding. I mean, you go if you, if you go out for a run on the road, you tell boxers to go for a run on the road, right? And you know, most like most of them will sort of you know that hit that middle ground. Most of them are running after the ice cream van. That as well. Just that, put it out there. <laughs> yeah, that as well. That as well. So the run after the ice cream van, and that's the only intensity that that we're getting in. I mean, like if you're if you're plodding along, I'm kind of thinking, right? Can we can we be doing a bit better with that? Can can we be getting you doing just 16, 20 minutes of work and then that's it rather than going out for your longer runs. So obviously, how many days, sessions or weeks or if it's a technical term, like a micro cycle, meso cycle, macro? Yes, Mo. 
basically how many <laughs> weeks does it take for our body to have that change? Or how many sessions? Or does it depend on the person? Of course, everything's going to be individual, right? It's a cop-out, right? I mean, like the, the S&C coaches, they're known for saying it depends. But there must be like a rough yeah, idea. Yeah, I mean, like for me, any sort of eight to 12-week period will have gains. If, you, if you're programmed in right, yeah, we'll have gains. Yeah, man, twice a week. If you're doing, do it properly, yeah, yeah. If you're doing two hit sessions a week, um, say if it's on the treadmill or outside or what bike or bikes, you know, if you've got, especially if you've got a bigger athlete, like a heavyweight, you really want them on the treadmill. They're already heavy as it is. Do you want them putting load through that? No, let's get them on the bike. I'm, I'm, I'm open to whatever gets the adaptation. I'm not set on a piece of equipment or, or a methodology. As long as I get the adaptation we're after, that's all that matters. Okay, from a boxing coach's point of view, what I find, especially with younger athletes, is they start really fast, but then they slow down really quick as well. So they sort of spend the energy too quick. So how would I improve an athlete from the, from the strength or from the conditioning point of view or from a therapy point of view? How could I make that athlete improve their performance without getting tired? Oh, so you mean in terms of a bout that we're yeah, talking about Yeah, competition. Here. Right, so, yeah. okay, so let's put, get some context in. So say you've got a young athlete doing three twos. Three twos. You know, they're good for the first round. Okay, second, third round, the blow, the blow a gasket. Yeah. Now, that's, again, is getting them tolerable to those high intensities. So the more that their body is, is, is used to being at that intensity, because at the end of the day, you know, even when they're, when they're sparring, right, sometimes we can detect spars and we're, and we're, we're, we're plodding, you know what I mean? We're working on technical elements. But when you're in a bout, you think about it, you're, you're in that 90% max heart rate. If you've not been in that, at that heart rate, don't expect to be able to tolerate it. You've got to be within those heart rate zones. And with it throughout your camp to be able to deal with the demands. So you said 90% max heart rate. So let's work it out now. So for the people out there who don't know the max heart rate, let's go to the basic calculation. Yeah, so 220 minus your age. That's that's the ballpark figure. So that's 100% max rate. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's your max heart rate. And then we've got 90% of that. So do you want, should we do yours? My maths is quite off. So but... let's say 220 minus my age, which is 495. <laughs> my age is 33, so... okay. So we're uh, 33, so your max heart rate is 187. Okay, yeah. So for your, so if we work out 10% of that, so round it up to 19 beats, times that by nine, I don't know off the top of my head, and then that's your 90% threshold. What The way that we do it, instead of, because obviously as an S&C coach, my maths can sometimes be off, I will get them on a heart rate monitor, get them in the session, actually monitoring the heart rate during the session. It's very simple with the app. You've got five different zones, and you say you want them Right then, today we're going to be working maximal intensity above that 90% heart rate. And that's why I like monitoring heart rate during the sessions. It's because, to cheat and blag it. Exactly. Because so someone's working the back, yeah, I'm working really hard, you know, Reese. I'm working really hard. Yeah, your heart rate's sitting at 160, you know. Now, that doesn't, sometimes you can think, yeah, they're being lazy assholes, right? Okay, they're being lazy. But then on the flip side of that, you've got an athlete who's working, who's a, who's a Trojan. They work so hard. They stick it in every session they turn up every time they put they give the max effort but they're sitting at one say they're really struggling they can't get in that zone but they're feeling really fatigued now we can think in it's an over we can monitor overtraining as well so if they're struggling at that intensity we say, oh, i've got nothing in the tank you know i've got nothing in the tank it's very odd for them to have nothing in the tank then we're thinking hmm is there some sort of overtraining mechanism going on so you can use it two ways are they being really lazy or is it monitoring for overtraining as well so that, that's where I, that, they're usually the two things that I go for, but mainly, <laughs> mainly it's... So let's say somebody out there, like myself, a coach, can't get a squad of 20 lads to you to get them checked or whatever. Would you recommend us using heart rate monitors in the gym? If it's, if it's accessible to them, yeah, I recommend it would. And but what kind of money are we looking at to buy one, so, roughly, like uh, an entry 60 level? Quid. It's quite affordable. So £60 for a heart rate, that's for the polar, polar beat. For the Wahoo ticker, which is again sound, you can monitor heart rate with that, 35 quid. So that would be good enough to monitor the heart rate. Yep. So if they, you know, instead of flicking through your Instagram during the session, set it up to the heart rate monitor, link it up, get people monitoring the heart rate and see, see what's going on there. And you can also use an RPE scale as well. So rate of perceived exertion, which uh, have, you, have you heard of that? Yeah, you've heard about it. So again, it's a scale of one, um, one to 10. How hard are you finding this session at the moment? Or but again, round? that one's where you can blag it. That's where you can blag it. Yeah, not. But then again, it's actually correlated really well with heart rate. So when people say are doing a really hard session and they say, right, my RPE is nine, it usually correlates quite well with each other. 
but it takes someone to know what that intensity feels like first. So you, for example, you've got someone who's brand new in the gym and they don't know what that max threshold feels like. They well, they've be, never been there. They've so never they been know, there. Yeah. So they're like, whoa, they even get to 60% of the way and they're like, whoa, call that off. Because they're not used, they're not used to tolerating that intensity. It's, it's, it's simple as that. Okay, there's a question here yeah, that always comes to mind, not just in boxing, but in any sport. Are you naturally gifted with any of these traits or components of fitness? Are you speed, strength, agility? Yeah, you are. There are people that are genetically, just genetically very, very good and have got very good genetics. And that is going to influence how much they can lift, how quickly they can move things. Obviously, you've got different muscle fiber types and all that sort of jazz, which we won't go into, but different muscle, and, and people have got, say, more of a particular muscle fiber that enables them to produce force very quickly. Whereas other people have got uh, muscle fiber types that allow them to be aerobically just, you know, you've got that guy in the gym who's just an absolute demon and he's got, he can just hold that intensity for a whole bout. Or, you know, you've saw kids before who just know how to just turn it on the last round and stick it on a kid. And after they've had two tough rounds before. So yeah, definitely a huge genetic component. But also what I would add to that is that these are qualities that can also be developed. Just because people have got different ceilings doesn't mean that they've reached their ceiling yet. It means that we can, we, we, these are qualities that can be developed. Even though someone maybe have a genetic predisposition towards a particular thing, doesn't mean it can't be developed. And um, Would you advise development at early age or a later stage? Well, listen, we have, we have athletes come to us who are, who are, who are different ages, you know what I mean? Like we've, we've got pe people who are like 15, 16 years of age who are just starting on their sort of you know, strength journey with us. And, and, and that I said, I, I would, ideally, you'll have someone early just because you can teach them everything. You can teach them all the movement patterns. You can teach them what, what, you, what you want and how the different positions and how you want things to look at an early age. Whereas you've got a boxer who comes to us, I don't know, let's, let's paint a picture. He's, 27, 28, he's had 50 amateur bouts, he's had 10 pro bouts. He's got all this, he's done no S&C, no, he's, he's done no mobility ever. And you've got to think about right then. He's got all these things going on, all these mobility issues. How are we going to now work around that? And that's something that we've been presented with before. And, and that understanding and how to right then. So listen, he can't say, for example, I don't know. Let, let's play in the picture. Someone's got limited hip mobility and deadlift they can't get to the full range of motion. They're slumping through the spine. Right then, okay then, but we need them to produce a lot of force now. We're in a max strength block, what are we going to do? Lift up the platforms. Get some platforms underneath him. Get him lifting in a partial range of motion. Lift him maximally with intent. Because if you don't do that, what's going to happen? He's going to be moving really poorly. He's going to be slumping through the spine and he's not going to be loading it as efficiently as what we, or as effectively as what we could. So it's about working through those different cases that are presented to us. And we do get more of the latter, more of the latter of people who've been through camps and been through, you know, not having SNC and not having um, particularly good um, mobility practices before. And they've got all these limitations and we're about navigating that. Okay, let's go on to recovery. So a lot of, especially young boxers, they don't believe in recovery. You tell them to have a break, coach, one more round on the bag. Coach, can I spar one more round? Coach, can I skip for another 10 minutes? Coach, can I go next door and just do a little run? They don't understand the end of the session means the end, the conclusion. Question is, what, what, should, what is the importance of rest? If I'm totally honest, the, the rest is the foundations for the rest of, the, of your training week. If you simply don't rest enough, you're going into a session, you're already handicapping yourself for a session. If you're not optimally recovered, and I say this to boxers all the time because, you know, you've got a, you got a bunch of young teenage boxers, they're on the phone late, they're doing this, they're scrolling through their Instagram feed, they're not getting enough sleep. We need to be trying to tackle that issue of sleep, minimum eight hours. If you recover, if, 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 you, if you're training twice a day, if not more, so, so important. I'm reading a book at the moment, it's actually called Why We Sleep, and it gives you all of the the mechanisms behind why sleep's so important. And I was like, geez, that's quite a lot, this. And it's something that we, that we don't really think about because everyone thinks about, oh, the fancy cryo chamber, the fancy this, the fancy that. Now, nah, man, get your protein in and get yourself eight hours of sleep first before you even can... See. Look, I see these guys having sports massages. I ask him, I say, yeah, you, how'd you sleep last night? Oh, I slept terribly now. I'm like, 
we need to get we need to get the the meat first before we even start thinking about these little these little things. We need to get sure we got the majority and the the big gaping gap in our recovery right first before we start thinking about all the the fancy insta jazz stuff. You know what I mean? You, you know what it's like the insta jazz. I'm in the cryotherapy chamber doing this, doing that. Nobody nobody going to read a post about oh sleep eight hours a day. You know what I mean? So it's not people are like, oh all right then. You know what I mean? Whereas that's that's the fundamental thing. I mean, like, are you eating enough protein? Are you? Are you getting eight hours of sleep? If you're not doing that, don't even bother going to spend your money on the on the on the little one percent yet. You haven't even mastered that. Let's master that first. Okay, then. So let's go on to flexibility. So a lot of boxers, in particular, I don't know what it is. It's changing slowly, but I've got yoga instructors in to do flexibility work, and they've absolutely loved the session. They've struggled, no matter how strong, fit they think they are. They've struggled and the yoga instructor is a lot older than them and a lot more flexible and put them to shame basically. So what's the importance of flexibility and how does it benefit an athlete? Well, there's two in terms of flexibility, I mean the the the, the go to is is that you're more mobile, so you got so for example, for a boxer, they're limited in their trunk rotation, say. You think about their force production. They can't actually get in that position to even get that shot off, and that's that's fundamentally the the thing that we that that I consider. I mean, like especially, and and just from an injury prevention standpoint as well, is that if you don't use something, you lose it, and we should all aim to have have adequate levels of mobility and flex. And having your yoga instructors into great a great thing, by the way, because as well, it's not you enforcing it; it's someone external enforcing it and they're more likely to buy into something when an external comes in right if you're telling the box the box if you tell them as a boxing coach like, oh yeah you know what i mean can just sort of you know fly over the head um but again back to your question in terms of why is it important is again we've reeled off the injury prevention mechanisms we've reeled off is that can the athlete actually get in the positions that we want them to to be successful um and just general athlete well-being as well like Nobody wants to be like walking about like a stiff head all the time, you know what I mean? Like you want to be able to, you know, quite easily get in the positions and the and the and that you want to get in, um, whether that's in a boxing context or just a an S and C context or just a general general life context. Um, nobody wants to walk around feeling like, you know what I mean? So that that that's that's the importance for me, um, and that's what I mobility is something that it's 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 the little gains, you know what I mean? It's something that gets shrugged off a lot. You think about, right, then we've got a boxer who's, you know, this is hypothetical, by the way, but, you know, he's saying he's trying to get into, you know, the GB squad. Trying to win a British title. He's trying to do this, do that. Little 1% man. If we've mastered the, the, the baseline of what we want, we've got to start thinking in 1%. And these are the standards that we need to hold people to if they want to get to where they want to get to. And people are like, for example, with, with people we work with, Going off, going off on a tangent in terms of flexibility, but you know we've got an online training app that all of our athletes are on, and it links to my fitness pal. And out because how many times have you spoke to a boxer? You're like, what have you been eating? Oh, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean? I can't remember. With obviously, it takes the athlete to do it and input it, but we. One of our standards is every athlete that we work with has got to input that for us, and on a Friday or a Saturday, we'll oversee it and we drop my message or we send it to the coach. And because you know you want to know what's going into them, right? And and if the biggest issue we was having was is that how can we monitor them outside of the sessions? You know, they see me twice a week. How can we monitor things for the other <laughs> twenty two hours a day? And and nutrition is a big thing. And I'm not saying that I'm the best at nutrition, but I'd like I like to know what's going into into their bodies. And and obviously, it takes the athlete to do it. The amount of times I'm having to drop text out, so make sure you do, make sure you fill in your fitness plan. Because they're not used to it. Exactly. Well, slowly it's a, it's and surely. It's a new practice. Yeah. It's a brand new thing. Don't expect in a brand new thing to come in and everyone be like, oh, I'll bow down to Reese. No, you've got to work at it. You got Don't just expect it to be coming. Everyone, you to walk in as this big S&C coach, new kid on the block, and everyone's going to love you and love your practices. No, it takes time. No one's going to buy into you straight away. It's up to us to educate and influence that. If we're getting in people's heads outside of the session, that is the... M Biggest win of my week. When someone drops me a text, oh, Reese, I've, I've filled, in, filled in all, my, all my, 
my fitness pal this week. I've done my mobility. Mate, that is massive. That's bigger than the session because you're influencing them outside of it. It's a behavior change. It's a behavior change, exactly. Anyone can do what, it's, we're in our environment, in the SSC gym, they're most likely going to do what we say. It's an unfamiliar environment. They're going to do what they're told. Whereas outside of it, can we get in their heads outside of the session? Can we influence that positive behavior change that we want outside of the session? That's the biggest thing. That's massive. Yeah, it makes sense to me. The, that's one of the qualms I have with young athletes when they say, coach, I need to do more of this. I need to do more of this. I need to, and you're like, you're in the gym. Let's say even you're five sessions a week. What are you doing in your own time? And if you're not there, you don't know. Um, so having something to track or making them actually have the input, it's a two-way conversation, isn't it? Which is more effective from my experience. Yeah, and, 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 and it's not just, we, track, we don't just track nutrition on there. If I always say to them, what's, what's your sessions like? What, what sessions are you doing a week? So the boxing sessions will be on there. The running sessions will be on there. The S&C will be on there. And I, I'll put like daily habits on there. Track my calories. Hit my, hit my calorie type. Hit my protein type. Um, do my mobility every day. Put that in there. And I'll say to them, literally, you have to tick it. If you don't tick it, you will get a message off me to say, has it been done? Everyone's like, uh, you know, everyone says it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did it. I just forgot to tick it. I want to see that it's ticked. And obviously, you, and you, you open yourself up to people saying, well, they might tick it anyway. Well, okay then, but that's going to... show the results, be, won't it? It's going to be a detriment to their... Why would you, why would you want to lie about it? You, you, you want to... Of course, you, 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 we want everyone to get better, but I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, okay, they could lie, but why would you want to? It's going to, it's going to be disadvantage <laughs> to yourself. Disadvantage. You're doing yourselves a, an injustice by doing it. So on these podcasts, we, it's our tradition that the guest wraps up with the last few words of advice. But I'm going to ask you to also include in your contact details for your Instagram or a website. So if people want to reach out and work with you, how they can reach you. So if you just use that middle camera there, give your final message. You can make it as fun as you like. You can make it words of wisdom. Yeah, let's go with words of wisdom. So this podcast has been about listening to and to having conversations to understand. And that's the biggest, foremost thing to any person, boxing coach, SNC coach, any person, listen to understand, not to be understood first. And also with all these COVID-19 restrictions and everything going on, a great saying I like to say is that a smooth sea never met a skilled sailor. So we're going to keep riding these choppy waters and we're all going to get through it and better things are to come. Um, if you're interested in my social media, follow us. Um, it's at BC underscore therapy underscore conditioning. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Feel free to drop me a message anytime. If you've got any questions about S&C, training in general, more than happy to answer any questions. Yes, yeah, so I just fire away. Yeah.